Take your Bibles. I hope you brought your Bibles tonight. We're going to be all over the place as uh, we uh, venture into the message. The message entitled tonight, Focusing on Jesus. I'm not sure. Well, I know for sure there's not a better thing to focus on than Jesus Christ. And uh, you'll find my text in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, mainly verses 2 and 3, but I'm going to read the last verse of chapter 11 and then the first verse as well. But I want you to get in your mind tonight and ask yourself the question, am I really focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ? The last verse of chapter 11, and as you know, uh, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter, talking about all the, the giants of uh, Bible history, and um, some that are, are seemingly unknown that are mentioned here as well, but uh, how their faith grew as uh, they focused upon the Lord. And it tells us in uh, verse 40 of Hebrews chapter 11, God having provided something better for us. Don't you like the better? Don't you like things that uh, God has provided for you? And we're going we're gonna to share some benefits tonight here in just a little bit. I think that will bless your heart. At least I hope they will. Uh, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. In other words, we do need to focus some attention on those uh, spiritual giants that are found in Hebrews 11, but mainly focus upon Jesus and what he did through their life. Um, then in verse 1 of chapter 12, we know that the word therefore is there for a reason. It's tying into uh, that chapter, tying back into chapter 11. It says, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And by the way, I do not believe that this is talking about a grandstand in heaven and they're up there looking down upon us. I believe this is talking about uh, these people that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. We need to go back and, and uh, study their lives and how they went through life, how they journeyed through life, and, and how their focus uh, was upon Jesus. And it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And obviously that's the challenge of chapter 12. But you will not be able to do that if you don't have your eyes on Jesus. Okay? You won't be able to run the race if your eyes are off of the, off of the Lord and, and on to other things. And so he says here in verse 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus... Now that word looking means to look away from something and to fix your eyes on, on the right thing. And so tonight, we want to focus on the right thing. And that right thing is Jesus Christ. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We know that's where he's at today. He is making intercession for you and me. And uh, I'm telling you something, folks. Uh, we need to be interceded for sometimes in our life, do we not? And he is uh, representing us to his Father. Then it says, for consider him. Now, I think that's an important phrase. I think it really ties into that phrase, looking unto Jesus. Because we need to really consider what Jesus Christ has done. It says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now I find that to be an interesting verse, an interesting phrase in the verse that says that we could become weary and discouraged in our souls. And I began to think about that uh, yesterday as I was beginning to prepare this, and I got to thinking about some of the things that I hear people say. And I'm going to go through those things as we go through five different benefits. Uh, and I hope and pray that it will encourage you not to be discouraged. Okay? We don't, God doesn't want us to be discouraged. He wants us to, be, uh, to have an abundant life, and he wants us to have joy uh, within our heart. And so we're going to look at five things uh, tonight uh, as we begin this message that I believe will be beneficial to us and actually they're going to be benefits for us if we will look at it that way and understand what uh, Jesus, what God is doing for us. And like I said, we're going to be all over the Word of God. And I, I pray that you will 
uh, either use your phone or use your, uh, the, the scripture there, or if you need to use the board, that's fine too. But uh, let's, uh, let's talk about focusing on Jesus. Now the first one we're going to talk about is relational benefits. Relational benefits. I will tell you this. The greatest relationship that you can have is with the Lord Jesus Christ, bar none. And I believe if you have the right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, you're saved, He is the Lord of your life, and uh, he is, you're walking with Him every day, I believe that all the other relationships in your life are going to be on a better, a better scale. Uh, your marriage will be better if it's done God's way. Your work will be better if you do it God's way. Uh, your, your pleasure, if you do it God's way, whatever it may be, uh, there are some benefits to having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to go into uh, the hundreds of different benefits that we have as, a, as we have a relationship, but you know we have access to God. Ronnie prayed that uh, in the beginning of his prayer, let us come boldly to his throne of grace. We have access uh, to God, but we also have peace with God. And I'm not sure that there's anything better than to have peace with God. You can lay your head down at night and you can put it on the pillow and you can go to sleep and knowing that uh, if you pass, you're going to be in heaven or if the trumpet sounds, you're going to be in heaven. But you have peace with the Lord Jesus Christ. But as I said, I have heard some things over the 41 years of ministry uh, and I jotted these down and uh, put some scripture with it. And here's the first one, in talking in, in relation to the relational benefits. Nobody really cares about me. Have you ever heard that? And I've heard this out of Christians' mouths in counseling sessions and thus like. Well, I want you to know something, and I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John, you know, that's before 2 John, right? 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says this. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a, the propitiation. That means the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So there's no way anyone could ever say that, some, that nobody cares about me. That verse there explodes with the love of God upon all people. He, he was the atoning sacrifice for all sins. Folks, that's a benefit to me, knowing that God loves me and that I have that kind of relationship with him. Well, I, another thing that I've heard over my ministry, I feel all alone and nobody wants to be my friend. Now, that's a sad state to be in. That's a sad place to be in. I wouldn't want to be in that place but there's some people that feel that way. Now turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Let me read these verses. Verses 14 and 15. Again, I feel all alone and nobody wants to be my friend. In verse 14 it says, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now these are red letters. These are words of Jesus. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. Who's the greatest friend you have? You know, you may say your spouse, and that's a good friend. You may say your children, that's, that's great. But the greatest friend that you can have in life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave his life for you. So, if you feel alone and you feel like nobody wants to be your friend, let me tell you, Jesus is there to be your friend. Can I get an amen for that? He wants to be your friend. But another one that I've heard uh, within this relational benefits and from discouraged souls, I can't forgive that person. I've heard this so often in my ministry, folks. I just can't forgive what they've done to me. Then they'll say, well, you really don't understand what they did to me, or you really don't understand what I've gone through. I just can't forgive. Well, there's some scripture that people need to, to hear, and one of them is found in Matthew 18, verse 33. It says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Isn't it great that Jesus has mercy upon us? 
Grace is that unmerited favor, that undeserved favor, but mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And I'm glad that we have that kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read uh, the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, however you want to call it. But it begins here in verse number 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But it doesn't really end there. I know it's an amen, but let me emphasize the next couple of verses. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Listen, folks, if you've got an unforgiving spirit, get rid of it. Amen? Because it will get you nowhere. And uh, I just want you, to, I want you to see that, that it's a relational benefit to know that God has forgiven you and that you have the means within you because of the Holy Spirit of God living in you. You can forgive others, those who have trespassed against you. Now let's go on to what I call intellectual benefits intellectual benefits. And I hear people say and have heard people say, it's impossible. There's no way it can happen. And they have a discouraging look about them thinking that, uh, that there's nothing that can be done. Well, it tells us in Luke 18 verse 27, it says, what is possible with men, <laughs> or impossible with men, is possible with God. Isn't it great to know God's on your side? God has this. We, we use that phrase. Mike and I use the phrase, God's got this. We, we, we love to use that because we believe that, that uh, you as a whole are in the hands of God. And whatever journey you're on, whatever uh, trial you're in, or whatever it is, he is there walking beside you. And if you think it's impossible, hey, it's possible with God. Turn to Jeremiah chapter, uh, chapter 32 and look at verse 17. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. I love how this verse expresses. It says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. And then it says, There is nothing too hard for you. Man, we have, we have God on our side, folks. And if you have that thinking in your mind that, God can't do something. You need to turn that around and say this, God can do it in my life. Mark 9.23, turn there. Mark 9.23. I told you we'd be searching some scripture tonight. Mark 9, verse 23. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. A child with the unclean spirit. And uh, maybe in your thinking, your belief system is not where it ought to be. But I'm going to tell you, um, with God, it's possible. Now, I've heard this. I can't figure things out. I'm confused. You ever heard anybody say that? I'm confused. Well, let me give you a verse that stands out among a lot of verses, and uh, it's one of my favorite. It's in John chapter 14, verse 6. It states very simply, very emphatically, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without him being the way, there'd be no going. Without him being the truth, there'd be no knowing. And without him being the life, there'd be no living. There's no confusion in that. I mean, there's nothing there to, to figure out. It's there, and Oprah Winfrey can say whatever she wants, and did years ago, there's many ways to heaven. Well, folks, there's not. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And you've got to get your mind wrapped around that. 
And I think, Brother Scott, if we'll get our minds wrapped around that, we're going to tell more people about Jesus. Because there are a lot of confused people in our world today. And so, uh, that's, to me, that's a benefit, knowing uh, in our mind uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the way. Now, one of my life verses is found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Folks, if you're confused tonight, just hang on to that passage. Uh, trust Him. Let Him guide your paths. And then, I've heard this, and I'm not smart enough for what lies ahead of me. Well, you know what? None of us know, knows, what, knows what's going to happen tomorrow, right? We don't know what's going to happen an hour from now. We don't know the future. But I know somebody that does, and that's God. And he says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul writing, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in me. In other words, they're in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 simply says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's talking about letting the attitude that Jesus had be within your thought process, within your intellect. And then we find number three, we find there are physical benefits. I've heard people say, I'm tired. I'm burnt out. I can't do it anymore. Well, what does Jesus say? I want you to, uh, to look at uh, a passage, um, Matthew chapter 18. Excuse me, I think it's Matthew 11. I didn't write it down, but it, thoughts come to my mind here. Yes, Matthew 11, 28. It says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Hey, if you're too tired, just, just let Jesus take over. If you're burnt out, let him light your fire again. Amen? And uh, uh, don't sit around acting like you've been vaccinated in pickle juice or something. You know, let him, let him have your life. Well, I've heard these people say, or heard some people say this, I can't manage what I have. I struggle financially. I struggle emotionally. I struggle in so many ways. Well, the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 answers that. It says, I will supply all your needs. My God shall supply all your needs. Not some, not most. What's it say? All your needs according to his riches. And I, I'm going to tell you something. The Waltons aren't as rich as Jesus. There's nobody as rich as Jesus. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. And I'm telling you, it is according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Then there's emotional benefits. Again, I've heard, I've heard some say, I'm not able to carry this heavy burden. Folks, we really can't do it on our own, can we? We need somebody to come alongside of us. And emotionally, we need that. Uh, we need our spouse to be beside us. We need our children to be beside us. We need our friends. But mostly, we need Jesus Christ to be beside us. And it says in Psalm 55, verse 22, turn there, Psalm 55. Don't you just love the book of Psalms? Psalm 55. And notice what it says in verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord. And the Lord, if you notice there, all the letters are capitalized. So that is referring to Yahweh. That is referring to Almighty God. You're talking about A to Z. He's got all the answers. He's got all, all the remedies that you need. And it's found in that word Lord. And He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. And then there are those that say, I am afraid and I fear the worst. I've dealt with that on several different occasions, folks. 
But he tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. I'm telling you what, we need all that going through life's journey. We need the spirit of, uh, the spirit of power. We need to allow the Holy Spirit of God fill us every day, walking in our journey, beside us and, and within us every day. We need to, we need to uh, express love every day, and we need to have a sound mind. Again, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Some say, I'm worried and I'm frustrated. Folks, we got a lot of we got a lot of warriors in the world today, and we have a lot of frustrated people. But he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he says, Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Man, there's nothing greater than to know that there's a God in heaven that cares for you. Some say, I don't have any peace in my heart. I don't have any peace in my mind. Well, he says in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I know a lot of times we, we base a lot of things on our emotions but I want to tell you something. God knows what your emotions are and how to He knows how to help you with your emotions. Well, the last one on that point is this. Life is just so great, I'm tempted to take all the credit. You know, you have some that are bent that way too. I want the glory. I, I want the credit for what I do. Well, credit belongs to the Lord, right? And in Psalm 100, let's look at that. I know you know this. This passage probably by heart, but let's read it together. Psalm 100, it says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with madness. Is that what it says? How about with sadness? Uh-uh, how about with gladness? Joy within your heart. Come before his presence with... What? Do you sing every day? I know I drive Brother Mike crazy probably and from my office to his office. And it's, it's not like I'm singing in the shower or anything like that. It's just I'm not bellowing it out. But, you know, when a song comes on, I've just got to sing along with it. And that's okay, right? We've got to sing. And it's, that's what it says here. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. I like this next phrase, and not we ourselves. We don't deserve any credit. We don't deserve any glory. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Again, he owns it all. He has it all. And we belong to him. And then number five. I've got just enough time to wrap it up. There are spiritual benefits. But I've heard people say, the pressures from the world, the flesh, and the devil are too strong for me. And I shared the, this passage with you Sunday night, but, but I, it bodes uh, well for us to look at it again if you'll turn to 1 John chapter 2. Again, 1 John's before 2 John. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. I think we need to understand that. And I think when people get to the point to where they are so pressured and they're so frustrated with uh, caving into temptation, we need to read those verses and understand where, where all that comes from. It comes from the devil. It comes from Satan, the, the, the deceiver, uh, the evil one. But here's what we need to do. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the first commandment. Four things there. Your heart. Do you love Him with your heart? Do you love God with your soul? The very depth of who you are. 
Do you love him with your mind? You know, the Bible says our thoughts are not like, his thoughts are not like our thoughts. We understand that. But we do need to focus on Jesus and get our mind loving God. And then our strength. Do you, with all your strength, are you giving it all you have for the Lord? And then I heard some say, it seems like God doesn't hear me when I pray. I love what 1 John 5.14 says. And we're right there at it, so turn to it. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything, He hears us. Is that what He says? If we ask anything according to His will, it needs to be the will of God, He hears us. And then the last one, I'm too far gone to be forgiven. Scott, you probably have dealt with that among people you have witnessed to as well. And a lot of people feel like they've gone too far. A lot of people feel like they've done too much for God to forgive. I want to tell you something, folks. God will save you no matter what you've done. He says in 1 John 1, 9, you know this verse, if you confess your sins, and I know this is primarily talking to uh, Christian folks here in that particular context, but we still, if you confess your sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As Pastor Mike has said, you need to do that every night before you go to bed. Every night. Ask God to reveal to you the sin in your life, and then do business with the Lord. It's a benefit to know that He's there for us and that He will forgive. John 7, 37 and 38, last verse, turn there. Verse 37 of John chapter 7. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So if you're a person that says, I've gone too far, God can't forgive me, I promise you, there can be a living river of water running out of your life. And I want us, as we close, I want us... I want you to join me, and Denise, if you'll put these words up on the screen. Focus on Jesus. I think what we're going to have to do, folks, is turn our eyes back upon him. Not just individually, not just as a church, but as a country as well. We need to turn our eyes back to Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Now, I felt like I did a solo there. I want you to sing it with me, okay? Why don't you stand and do that, and you'll stretch for just a second. Stand and sing. And uh, not only turn your eyes, but turn your heart to him tonight, focusing on Jesus. Ready? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I thank you for all the benefits. Lord, they're so numerous that we can't count them. But God, I know this was a little different twist and a little different angle. But God, I hope and pray they got it. And Lord, I hope and pray that we'll walk out of this church building with our total focus upon you. Our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
You may be seated. Brother, uh, Brother Chuck's going to come and do our prayer time tonight. Brother Chuck. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.